Okay, hello everybody. It is extra wonderful to see you all here today and I really can't say how much we appreciate you coming out for, for this session. Um, we know that everybody here is, is probably dealing with a million and one different things, both on the personal and professional level. So it's, it's really wonderful to have you here with us and with the cat tail in my face. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, thank you. And, and we are going to proceed pretty much as, as we usually do with this call. It's, we're trying to keep as much of it to business as usual, um, but we know that that's not the case in most places. So we hope this is a chance for you to all be here together and, and with us and, and still talk about the things that we all care about um, and the work that we think is so important important in, in multitude of ways. Um, so again, thank you for, for taking the time to be here. Um, and so today we are talking about multimedia, uh, which is a pretty fun one to dig into. I had a lot of fun writing the description for this session. You might have seen my in a book nerd come out. Um, and really there, there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of history of, of textbooks being more than just text. And so that's kind of what we wanted to play with here. And we have some fantastic guests lined up to share their experiences with it. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to my illustrious co-host, uh, Karen, from from OTN to introduce our speakers. Hi everybody, I too am glad to be here with you and thank you Zoe. I am going to start by introducing three special guests. You already met one of them and that's Puck, Zoe's cat, and then Naomi is joined by Pythagoras and Marple. We may meet those two cats later and I have a hunch there may be other cats in this Zoom room with us. Um, but our four guests today who are going to speak to the topic are Naomi Selman. She is instructional consultants at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Chelsea Green, who's associate professor of music at the American University in Cairo. Nadine Abumagad, senior instructional designer at Digital Education, the Center for Teaching, excuse me, for Learning and Teaching, also at the American University in Cairo and Josie Gray, who's advisor of inclusive design and OER collections at BC campus. Uh, if this is your first time at office hours, we turn things over to each of our guests for a short introduction to the topic, and then we turn things over to you. So please be thinking about your questions for everybody and topics that you would like to explore further. So to get things started, I'm gonna hand things over to Naomi. Um, so I can give a little bit of context for where I'll be thinking with um, this topic. I uh, got to follow in Amanda Larson's footsteps as the OER TA for UW-Madison, which is a lot of letters, but basically means that I got to partner with a lot of instructors who were interested in OER's opportunities, not just to um, you know, connect with students um, at the level of financial access, but to, to do more formative assessment with their texts. Um, and so I um, was able to collect a number of resources of people trying like both higher and lower tech ways of embedding annotation into their um, OER or simply having, you know, ad additional ways for students to uh, contribute um, pictures of their own, kind of embracing that open pedagogy, um, or you know, using some H5P technology, um, or even trying to build in some experimental Google um, functionality into, you know, Google Forms, visualizing poll results, things like that. Um, so I'm happy to talk um, about various things on the spectrum of multimedia and textbooks. Thanks so much, Naomi. Chelsea, over to you. Hi, um, super happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, was, is it okay if I go a bit longer than Naomi? Uh, I appreciate her brevity, but now I feel like a hog. Okay, uh, is this my five minute sort of window to yes. do my thing? All right, yeah. cool. then I will do it. And uh, by all means, get the hook out if I go over, because I am a rambler. And I also feel like I need to contextualize, you know, my book a bit which will take some time so uh let me also that's the link to the book for those who might be interested in referring to it and uh so i have some notes i'll be referring to here uh, first i just want to say that i'm really happy to be part of the rebus community i look at it i look at the rebus community as something somewhat utopian i'm sure we all do and i think especially now 
uh, utopian concerns are of utmost importance. Um, they always are, but I'm s I'd like to say something that's a little bit political and not very partisan, but in this crisis we're all going through, which is a health crisis and may turn to an, a big economic crisis, I think it's really important to think utopian. I think it's important to look, like think about a phoenix rising. We want to sort of see what, what new structures can rise out of the ashes. And maybe it's time for some older structures to just remain, uh, remain in the past. All right, let me, let me talk about my book a bit. So the book I created is called Sight Reading for Guitar, The Keep Going Method. And for those of you who don't know what sight reading is, uh, it's one kind of tiny aspect of being, especially a, a, a musician in the, in the sort of Western European tradition. Um, some, you may have heard people say it's super important. I don't think it's the most important skill to have as a musician, but it's, it is a really important skill and it's one that I love. Um, I, it's also, it's for guitarists, it's extremely hard to develop this skill for reasons I won't get into. And most people don't do it alone. You need to do it with a good teacher. Um, the reason I thought of creating a book about, you know, teaching sight reading for guitarists is sort of twofold. Um, one, when I moved to Egypt to teach, I met a, one, a lot of incredibly gifted guitarists who were interested in playing, you know, Western classical repertoire, but especially in that repertoire, you do need to know how to sight read. And a lot of them gave up because they hadn't developed a skill of sight reading. They developed everything else on their own. Um, and they turned to flamenco, which is totally fine. It's an incredible art form, an incredible genre, but in flamenco, you don't need to sight read. So a part of me was thinking, hmm, if this is happening in Egypt, where else is this happening? Also, sight reading, um, requires usually learning in a formal way. So it requires money, you know? And I was thinking, hmm, can I, can I do this in a way that people can learn and not have this financial barrier? And then I, I learned, I started learning through CLT about the flipped classroom. And I thought, you know, there are, I'd like to develop this anyway for my courses because they can learn, they can learn the theoretical part at home and, and practice some of the practical at home. And then they can come to me in class and we can work out some of the more like, emotional aspects of it or, theory, or, or conceptual aspects and um, develop the right attitudes, which is so important. And uh, so I was inspired by that as well. And um, okay, then I want to say what happened next is after I had this idea, I did think of monetizing it and making it my own for, for profit. But then I started talking to people at CLT, namely Mahabali and she sort of convinced me that I could get support to do it in other ways and eventually introduced me to the Rebus community. And so here we are, and I'm really happy about that. Um, the other people at CLT that will come up in the conversation are Nadine, who you'll meet in just a moment, Ahmed Zorani and Hassan Labib, who helped with the, the video portions. Um, Maha was more of like the pedagogical expert. And okay, so what technologies are used in this book? Um, well, before I get into that, uh, some of the bigger questions we were asking is, um, and we took a lot of time on this in the beginning, uh, what, what technologies would be most effective, of course, in helping the user, the student, the guitarist, whatever you wanna call the person, uh, acquire the skills and understand the content? Um, what's most effective for cost reduction and overcoming the financial obstacles? And of course, what's most engaging and appealing to the, to the demographic? That one has been still, causing me some problems, which I could talk about later. The, okay, now there are two components to the book, the theoretical and the practical. The theoretical is just where I sort of teach, hey, this is a treble clef, this is the note E, and go through the graphics. Um, and then the, the practical is where I've created lots and lots of scores, lots of transcriptions, play along exercises where they apply that knowledge and you know they take these symbols and um, they apply them and they start having to read the notes in real time. Um, so for the theoretical portion, we've done video and audio. Basically, this, the user has the option to learn from like sort of a written book format with graphics embedded and sometimes audio samples to sort of bring those graphics to auditory life. Uh, and then the, there's also, they could also learn though, just through a video of me teaching. So there's redundancy. 
Uh, Maha and I and Nadine really thought hard about this and thought the redundancy was good for a lot of reasons. Um, and there are links to hy hyperlinks to other, you know, open resources. And then in the practical, this is where it gets really wild in terms of multimedia. We have PDFs of scores, we have MP3 play along exercises, and we were aspiring to have movies with a scrolling score that has the audio synced to it. Yeah, oh, I see someone's face lighting up. Naomi, maybe I need your help with that because that's the one that's still throwing me for a gosh darn loop. Um, okay, beta testing results. So we did beta test. And as much as I wanted, me, my old school self, wanted my users to print the scores and play from them, which is common still. It's common practice in the music community. Uh, they, none of them did. They all played from their screens. And this is still my big crisis here. Um, clearly, eventually, we are going to need to get these scrolling scores going that they can play from. The reason I keep saying scrolling is because a lot of the scores are more than one page. So they're going to need to do a page turn. And with sight reading, the page turn is critical. If the page turn doesn't happen in, a, in the right spot, in the right way, in a consistent manner, that this will just completely derail all their, all their training, all their skill acquisition. And it's going to be very frustrating for the user. And all the balls are going to come tumbling down. That is the juggling act of sight reading. Um, so yeah, again, that's, that's, that's the cross to bear right now, is figuring out how to get that scrolling score going. I, it's not currently in the first edition. There are now thoughts of doing a second edition that will involve that. Um, I, and honestly, I haven't, found the right, I haven't found the right technology to make it happen in the way I need it to happen from a pedagogical standpoint. So that's still up in the air. That may be in the, in the second edition. And the, the last thing I'll end with is that I, um, so I, I don't know if you all know what MIDI is, M-I-D-I, it's basically just ugly digital sound to stand in for real music. <laughs> and nobody, no musician likes MIDI. It sounds horrible. It's like nails on a chalkboard to musicians. But uh, right now all the MP3s, the play along exercises are in the MIDI format because I think there are over 300 scores and exercises and I just don't have enough time to play them all and record them all and sync them all and la la la. And so uh, right now it's all MIDI. In the second edition, I also aspire to record all that stuff and have it be like actual nice, beautiful guitar sounds. Uh, but that's when I win the lottery and have all the free time in the world. So that is the end of my, my ramblings and thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Over to you, Nadine. Hi everybody, um, so I'm uh, Nadine Nabulmat. I work at the Center for Learning and Teaching at AUC. And um, I apologize if my connection is a bit choppy and please let me know as soon as you can hear me or can see me and I'll do my best to fix it. I know it's like the worst time to have connection issues since everything's going on remotely and online. So wish me luck. Anyway, so I'm a senior instructional designer at CLT and I was a project manager on this project with Chelsea, this wonderful uh, experience that we went through. Uh, I worked also with Matt Bailey on this project, as, uh, as Chelsea mentioned, and we had a lot of our CLT team helping us out with uh, things like uh, video recording and student technology assistance that helped us out a lot with the technology and the uploading element to the textbook. Um, so I'm going to, to answer to about the, uh, or talk to the, the multimedia and technology component of this conversation, since so much of my work I was either doing this myself or managing the technologists who were doing that. And, you know, I'm going to share a little bit about that. Um, so obviously incorporating multimedia in open textbooks is great. Incorporating it in learning is awesome because, you know, it adds to constructing new knowledge in many ways by getting readers or learners to visualize material and get exposed to different media other than text, which we're all used to and we all read all the time. Uh, but not only am I an instructional designer, I'm also a graphic designer by training, and I've been doing a lot of layout design during my career. So, I mean, that was a huge asset to this project, but it was also really frustrating because when you're working with different platforms, you're working with uh, you know, online platforms that are not as flexible as graphic design software. It gets really frustrating when you can't do it, make it do what you actually want it to do. When I like spend my entire life of graphic design having that kind of freedom to, you know, 
draw and you know put stuff wherever I wanted it to be on the page and I was limited by that a lot um but because of knowing how how things should look like from a visual and a graphic design perspective it made me um think about the learning as well I mean I'm, I was also the you know learning experience designer as well so I had to really think about where the learning has to take place and you know how how it was easy for me to actually let the small things go when I started shifting that state of mind. And, you know, from a learner experience design point of view, there are certain things that kind of take priority over, you know, the way it looks like visually or graphically. And I, I have to say that working with Chelsea was like, we were a great team on that because we were always questioning, you know, the, the, the decisions that we made visually and we were critically thinking about you know, what we were doing every step of the way and making sure that we're taking the right decisions from the learning perspective. And, you know, whenever we were stuck, you know, not being able to take any decision or anything, we just stopped and said, you know, well, what's more, more important for pedagogy, right? What important for the learning place and to focus on the learners and really making sure this book was beneficial was what kind of kept us on the right track and was able to, and this is what, how we were able to, to make these right decisions on and get press and follow our process until until this point so granted it is of course you know a little bit more challenging when it's content is very heavily dependent on multimedia and by multimedia in this case i mean images like for the graphics and the uh, musical notations and i'm talking about pdfs for the graphical scores uh, sorry the the scores the musical notes and i'm also talking about the mp3 files and finally there was also the element that was added later on which was the videos right the youtube videos uh which were created at the studio and then you know you know put up uh, uploaded on youtube and then embedded on onto the um, the chapters and pages of the book so trying to juggle a lot of that was you know a little challenging of course as you uh, as you may imagine uh but regardless of how many challenges we faced i honestly i would do it all over again because we we both learned so much uh we created something that would make a difference in guitar teaching and learning and we all contributed a huge project to the world of open textbooks and open education which is something i'm very proud of because i work a lot with uh online learning i mean that's pretty much my job and um i a lot of open education and I actually just published a book on open education in Egypt. Uh, sorry, not I'm thinking, I think, but it's a book chapter, not a full book. Um, it's about, uh, the, the book in general is about MOOCs, but this is, the, uh, that chapter is about the different faces of open in Egypt and the kinds of open education projects that we were, that we were part of. And honestly, this project with Chelsea is one that I'm very proud of as well. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. And now over to you, Josie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about the kind of work that I do, um, I am on the open education team at BC campus in Canada, and I manage our BC open textbook collection. So I'm responsible for adding new resources and that kind of thing. And I also support the publication and production of open textbooks in the province here. So I uh, work with faculty and help them get their content into mostly press books is what we use as our publishing platform. And then in addition to that, I provide provide training and support um, to faculty who are creating these OER and making them accessible for their students. Um, so I was going to uh, take a few minutes today to talk about accessibility in the context of multimedia and specifically um, audio and video is probably what I'll talk most about. Um, so for audio only content like podcasts and interviews and recorded lectures um, to make that content accessible there needs to be a transcript and when creating a transcript that uh, text needs to include basically a, an equivalent of the audio content. So the speaker's names, um, all relevant audio content. So that's like all of the speech content, any relevant descriptions of the speech. So if there's a tone that needs to be conveyed or something like that, and also descriptions of relevant non-speech audio. So if there's like other sounds happening in the background that's relevant, that needs to be included in the transcript as well. And then if the transcript is really long, providing headings and subheadings to make that document easier to navigate and providing a transcript ensures that people who are deaf or hard of hearing will be able to access all of the same content and it also provides that content in another format for someone who would maybe rather read um, than listen to the content for whatever reason. 
As for videos, all relevant visual information needs to be conveyed in an audio description or a transcript, and all relevant audio information needs to be conveyed either via captions or a transcript. So captions are text that is synchronized with the video sound, so it'll appear at the bottom of the screen. Um, I know I turn them all the time when using Netflix. Um, so that just ensures someone who can't hear the audio um, so that they can get that content or for someone who would like to read as they listen as well. And then audio descriptions are for someone who can't see the video and they would need descriptions of the visual content in the video, anything that isn't already being conveyed through the audio. And then if providing a transcript, a transcript would provide the same information as the audio transcript, but it would also include relevant descriptions of the visual content as well. And if you're involved in creating videos, you can kind of be proactive about this. So you can plan and design the video so that people who can't see the video still know what's going on without needing that additional audio description. So you can do that by having um, the people in the video or the narrator describe any important visual information while recording so that, um, so that, that um, providing an alternative format wouldn't be required in that case. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about how providing multimedia aligns with um, universal design for learning. Um, so including multimedia in open educational resources and open textbooks allows students to engage with, concept, with different concepts and different mediums, um, which can make the content both more accessible and more engaging. And it aligned, aligns really well with the principle of uh, multiple means of representation in the UDL framework. And one way that I've seen this done really well recently is there's a trades instructor in BC who's working on a math textbook and he's created these video walkthroughs of answers to math equations so that the students can try it on their own and then they can watch um, the video and hear the instructor explain the steps and watch the steps kind of happen in real time if they need additional help. And then providing captions for that video as well. Um, in other examples of multimedia that are accessible and help kind of provide that additional engagement, um, some of our instructors are starting to work more with H5P, which is an open source tool that allows instructors create their own interactive activities that can act as a sort of formative assessment for students, and then they can embed those activities directly into the open textbook. So a student could read a chapter and then go through this interactive activity at the end to engage in the content that way. And then another really cool example, I think of accessible multimodal OER are the FET simulations created by the University of Col Colorado, Col Colorado Boulder. Um, so they make these interactive simulations for science and maths topics, and they've been working really hard to make those simulations accessible for students with disabilities. So I would definitely recommend checking out um, their work as well. And that's all I wanted to talk about. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Josie, and thank you all of our guests for your introductions. Now is the time when we call on everyone who is here to ask your questions. Feel free to do so in the chat or unmute and ask your questions uh, using your voice. Um, however you would like to do so, please jump in. As people are formulating, I have one for Naomi. I was wondering if there is a particular project that you tend to use as like the, the show off the cool things that you can do sort of project, one that helps make the case for what can be done. Um, and then also in relation to that, when you're having these conversations for people um, with people, if there are any places where you run up against resistance about moving into the space of, of doing more than, uh, you know, more than would say they might have expected to do as they undertake a project. Absolutely. So what I have just tucked into the um, group chat is a resource that I was creating to kind of showcase like here are a bunch of different approaches that um, thoughtful instructors and authors have been um, using to um, within their textbooks. And the great thing about open textbooks is that the license allows you to use the material both for education about a specific content area, um, but also to say like, here is how you get things done. And um, my background is in teaching writing, so I love working with models. Um, so the OER source book was basically a collection of like, I'm working with a lot of instructors who are teaching language and they keep talking to me about how the asynchronous classroom has these particular limitations. And here are how a bunch of other instructors um, 
perhaps used H5P to um, address those questions. Um, so this is also a great opportunity for me to say this is an open project. And if there are things that have inspired you, um, I would love to continue to let this grow. Um, but I, I think that the place that I find kind of both most exciting and potentially most dangerous are um, there's a section within the text that is um, you know, below a lot of, you know, H5P demos, but there's a section called web only content and H5P um, iframe applications where um, there are um, embedded activities like a tool called Plotly that can help you visualize your R graphs um, in a very interactive way. And those I think are the places that a certain kind of instructor finds the most kind of exciting but also that are the most unstable. So I think to answer one of your questions about the challenges, um, encouraging people who are excited to experiment to kind of have a backup in mind. Um, and to, to Josie's points about um, thinking about accessibility, to, to consider ways that your, um, you are also building multiple modes of representation into the text if you're using interactive tools. Um, so maybe that's by writing a description or creating an alternative page that exports in the print document um, where something that would usually pop up when you clicked an icon um, is more easily accessible by, you know, say a screen reader. Um, uh, did that answer uh, all of your question or did more come up as I said that? No, that was great. Thank you. I think we see a, a few questions coming in in the chat. So I might um, hand over to Karen, I think has been keeping track of those. So um, there's uh, an exchange of links and resources in the chat going on, which looks great. And then I think the, the first um, sort of unanswered question is from Jonathan to Josie. Uh, if there are additional resources where the guidelines about what to do in parallel to video or audio are are written down or is there perhaps a way to get captions off this video well that's possible I can <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely I'm gonna post a link in the chat right now um, which is a link to the accessibility toolkits chapter on multimedia so it kind of goes over the exact things that I said transcript captions and audio descriptions and the link that uh, Perva posted about it's farther up um, Humber Humber College in Ontario recently created this open course on multimedia and they go really in depth into multimedia accessibility. So if you're really looking to get into the details, that's where I would look. Thank you, super. Chloe has a question. Um, generally, she says interactive and multimedia content is exciting, but would embedding more of that type of content make a textbook less accessible? in the case that the student wants to print out the book. And then Claire mentioned that you can um, substitute QR codes for multimedia. So can any of our guests uh, speak to this concern and possible ways to address it? Sure, um, I can start. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Nadine. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say something really, really short. Um, so the thing is with the, with the printing of the book, uh, in our case, there is a way to um, to, to print, to, you know, the text and stuff. So, and and the fact the fact that the videos are almost an exact carbon copy of the text explanations, I think that that's accessible for, yeah, you know, for accessibility centers that helps. And with the audio files, uh, Chelsea and I were actually talking about this and something we were planning on doing, um, you know, in, in a bit as soon as things calm down and we were able to to, to get everything done, which is to put all of the um, all of the audio files together in one big folder so that people could download them and be able to, to use their own tools, their own accessibility tools and technologies for playing them rather than having to go through the textbook itself. Um, so that's all. Yeah, I think that kind of addresses the question, like providing, um, like if the same content's already conveyed in the text, then the student will still get that information. And often there's ways to make sure you link back to any kind of interactive content that wouldn't be included in the print versions. So for people using Pressbooks, if they have videos embedded, Pressbooks will automatically create a link to that video that students can navigate to. Thank you both. Chelsea, did I see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing. I have a funny story. Um, you know, the power goes out in Egypt a little bit more than, you know, we would, you know, it does in the United States or whatever. 
uh, especially in the summer. Once I was teaching to my students and I was playing my classical guitar and I said, one of the reasons I love classical guitar is because when the power goes, and literally at that moment, the power went out. <laughs> and and uh, this, that's like such an Egyptian moment for me because like all these, all these wonderful things happen despite these difficult things there. So yeah, we all laughed and I, so anyway, the point of that anecdote is, I love the classical guitar because I can play it when the power goes out. And I really would love my book to be able to be used when people don't have internet access. You know, like they could just gobble up all the files. Yes, it would be kind of data intensive, but you know, they can just kind of use it whenever, especially teachers. My, my idea is when it, some of the users will be teachers using this with their students. You know, they can just put all this on their computer and it doesn't matter if they have good internet access or not, they can just navigate all this stuff. So uh, yeah, I think I, that's a, that was a big deal for me in creating this book. By the way, the book's not yet done and Nadine is correct in saying that's kind of one of our next steps as well. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, there are furry friends on the scene and I'm a little distracted because they're cute. Um, but I will put a question to Nadine and uh, you, Chelsea. Um, Nadine, you mentioned sort of the trade-offs as a designer and someone who likes to be able to really control the visual presentation of a project and how it was sometimes frustrating to not have that, that same ability working with these different tools. Can you share a particular example or trade-off um, that would illustrate that? Um, sure. So. Um... So many times the uh, actually added, so, so our original plan was to add the, um, the, 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 the graphics, the notations with the description, like their name and the, a little bit of an explanation of, uh, ab about that notation next to it and all in one table. And we wanted in, in some chapters, and if you can, you know, navigate to, you know, starting chapter two until the end of the book, you will see what, what I mean by that. Um, we wanted, there was a section on notations in each chapter and there was like maybe five or six at a time that were one under the other. And we wanted them to look very, you know, clean. One is, you know, right below the other. Um, and then with all the text in a table, in a table that is invisible so that you don't actually see the lines uh, in the table. So it looks really structured, but it looks laid out, um, you know, manually put that way and that kind of made it really visually very appealing visually really clear uh from a layout point of view and being able to just print this section and have all of the notations you know just in one you know page without having to also scroll too much to see all of them that was kind of i think the, 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 that was the first example that i thought about because that was the one that gave me so much pain trying to figure out how to do it so there were issues about you know, uh, read this book, uh, uh, the press book, sorry, is on, um, is on WordPress. And I knew WordPress from before, um, so I knew how to navigate some of, the, some of the issues there, but I had to, and I'm not a, a computer scientist, I don't know code. I actually learned HTML for this particular project, but just a little bit like the basics, uh, at least enough to know what Apurva was talking about, which told me to like, you know, delete that tag or, you know, delete that non-breaking space and all that. But um so so i tried a lot of that and i i followed so many of these of these uh recommendations that approva made and they were actually excellent like almost everything that she um you know advised us to do works really well but then eventually things were still not working out right so there were still uneven spaces and both the designer and me and the perfectionist in chelsea was like not you know we couldn't let that go we couldn't live with you know, one table being uh, with certain spacing and then the next chapter or the next table being with a different kind of spacing. And that was not really fixable from a technical point of view or from a, you know, design or manual way to do it. It was really not doable. So we had to really make an executive decision way, way, way far down the line to change that layout for all of the chapters completely and have them all under under each other. Like every, everything has to just go in, in without tables basically. So just using that concept, but without tables. So it would be now, now instead of being the graphic next to the text and the, and the title, it would be the graphic above the text, uh, sorry, the, the title, the graphic, and then the text below. So in a very linear 
way instead of you know visually laid out like we wanted it to be initially but then again we we thought about okay so what is really what is giving up this concept of that layout going to to, to affect right like what is, is it going to affect the benefit of our, of our learners or of our readers and we Chelsea and I it was so hard for us to actually admit that but we, we said you know what no it actually won't I mean it looks nicer but it really won't affect the learning process in any way and we just decided to do what was consistent what was professional and what was beneficial for the learning rather than sticking to a layout that looked nicer if i could add um yeah nadine this has taken me back to those conversations in your office where we were like pulling out our hair um <laughs> As you can see, Nadine is so wonderful to work with. She's not only articulate and creative and smart, but like we we also have this like really intense standard we were trying to go go for uh, for I don't know various reasons I suppose. Anyway, I just wanted to show you what she was saying, and I, I wanted to add one thing. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but, I wasn't able to do that. I'm using my phone's connection. And it's oh, not easy to do that. And so if you'd like to please hey, yeah. I'm happy to be the tech savvy person right now, Nadine. It's a rule reversal. <laughs> um, okay, so, so basically, um, pedagogically speaking, the, the one reason why I really, oops, ooh, what happened? Okay, I spoke too soon. I am not, oh, here it is. Is this gonna work? Yay, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the only reason, one of the, we also had some peer review one of the peer reviewers gave this really nice criticism that, you know, he thought the book was kind of too verbose and that the, there, was, there was too much emphasis on the descriptions and not enough on the graphics. And I mean, I think that it could have, you know, I, his crit critique was so important to me. I, I realized, yes, I, I really want to make the graphic the central thing and minimize the descriptor if possible, because this is about, getting people to understand you know perceive and process the graphic as fast as possible that's what sight reading is um and so the reason i wanted a table it, for pedagogical reasons so you can see here so this is teaching different articulations okay this is called a tenuto it means hold the note a bit longer this is an accent it means play it with more emphasis um, marcato even more emphasis staccato play it short so you you know you you can see how these could all be in a table and what we did originally is we had the graphic to the left and then the description to the right and so it allowed the user to just kind of take it all in in an eyeful and uh, you know really focus on the graphics understand the differences in the symbols and you know kind of see them as a unit of a, a group of concepts like related concepts and a variation on the theme now that they're not in a table they it sort of looks like each one is just so important and each one now has to be memorized and i i think just conceptually the user is gonna be a little bit more overwhelmed by this layout uh let it's less elegant from a pedagogical like a learning standpoint um, but whatever, that's okay. You know, we decided that this is what it can do. It still looks good. And also my thought was most of the users are going to use the video anyway. And the video is a bit more elegant in the way the graphics are shown and described. Uh, and Mahabali was saying, you know, the video is probably going to be the primary way of learning this content. And then the written part will be there as a reference for later when you want to review the ideas. So once Mahabali put that thought in my mind, I just thought, okay, cool. If this is a reference and it's not the primary uh, source of learning, um, then okay, I think it's gonna work. Anyway, that's, that's the short of it, the Thank long of it. I think that's a, a really important point and uh, a prover actually isn't in a position to unmute but posted a question to me um, to ask, I think maybe to get uh, Naomi and Josie to jump in as well. Um, she was asking how do people make the decision of whether to or not to add a multimedia element and how much of that is about engaging the learner or making the book more aesthetically pleasing and what are your kind of experiences of, of that decision making because it is I think there is a temptation to you know get really caught up on and um, you know the presentation and there's a line maybe it's a gray area between when that's about what it looks like and when that's about how it functions um, so I'd love to hear from either of you on that too
I can share a little bit about um, kind of a learning curve that I went through around that same issue. Um, a separate project that I was working on um, as I was learning about how multimedia and textbooks could work um, was an open textbook I created as part of my dissertation. Um, and that was a critical edition of a Victorian novel. Uh, it was called The Woman in White Grangerized um, to refer to a particular kind of um, annotation that happened during the 19th century. And I wanted students to be thinking about all the ways they interact with books and to be thinking about how they opt in or out, uh, opt out of things and saying like, oh, there's an annotation layer and you can write in it. Oh, there are glossary elements and they, you can pop them out. Oh, you know, like maybe you want to add to this interactive timeline. And some of the, the people that I was speaking to were like, we don't, there's too many, like, I, I'm very overwhelmed. And I was like, oh, but that's part of it. You know, like, oh, it's all about thinking about text. But there was also like a certain point where people were saying like, I mean, like, yes, but, but it's also a little bit intense. Um, so it sort of detracts from the experience of it. And so um, that was kind of a, a learning curve for me. Um, and one of the decisions I ultimately made, and I can see if I can share my screen as well, sort of unload, uh, move out of the sort of house of cards of tabs that I've created with this chat, um, was to use a tool that um, UW-Madison has um, created um, as a, a, something that I'm actually really hoping that you uh, will be a part of larger uh, press books someday. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to let this show you all the right Google um, Chrome. So you might see the wrong screen for a moment. Um, You know what I lied and it's um, definitely not going to do that but but in any case um, what uh, moving away from that what we ended up doing was embedding a lot of the interactive multimedia activities in the hypothesis annotation layer um, so the hypothesis annotation layer is a tool that you can toggle on or off so that when you click on specific parts of the page um, that are highlighted in yellow um, a sidebar scrolls out and UW is able to post multimedia H5P activities inside of that sidebar. So that kind of allowed people to opt in or out, opt out of the over, like the visual overwhelm of being like, oh, and you can also like learn about some terms over here, or you can also like, you know, add your own comments over there. Um, so try to think about creative ways um, to, to reduce overwhelm. Josie, you mentioned um, transcripts and captions and the importance of those. And I'm just wondering if uh, together we can briefly talk a little bit about tools. We've mentioned annotation tools like Hypothesis and H5P. I've used Otter AI for um, transcriptions. I'm just wondering if there's any particular tools that you're finding really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for like, I think if you're creating your own videos, the easiest way to create transcripts is to use YouTube because YouTube will auto caption it for you. And then what you have to do is go in and edit those captions. So that's kind of like the fastest, like balancing cost and speed, that would kind of be like a good medium. Um, like for a lot of institutions in BC, they have access to a shared service called Kaltura. And so the Kaltura is a video hosting service that has a similar feature that lets you do that. And you can also do that with um, with audio recordings as well. There are paid services that will caption videos for you. Um, one I've recommended before is Rev, but I don't recommend them anymore because they don't pay their employees very well. Um, but there's another one called Amera, and Amera lets you caption your own videos for free, or you can pay other people to do it as well. Um, so there's kind of lots of different avenues and technologies that you can use to to do these things. I think to um, Google Slides now has some captioning features. Could you, do you know those well enough to speak to them, Josie? Yeah, so Google Slides and PowerPoint, if you have Office 365, um, they'll let you do live captioning. Um, so if you, I've used it before for previous um, conference presentations um, in, I just used, put my 
uh, slides into Google Slides. And then if you're in Chrome, there's a little option that pops up when you're in presentation mode and you just turn it on and captions will appear at the bottom of the screen. Um, so I haven't tried it in PowerPoint yet, but it should work the same. And I know some uh, video conferencing tools have those built in as well. So if anyone uses BlueJeans, BlueJeans has an auto captioning tool that works really well. I'm not sure about Zoom, I don't think so, but yeah, there are those kind of like nice tools built into a lot of things. Thanks, Josie. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to very quickly say about accessibility is that not only um, were we designing for that, so from the very beginning, we made sure that you know, everything was going to be uh, colors wise, it will be very accessible. And uh, in terms of the video itself, we didn't want to use any, uh, any, um, any colors that were not friendly for, you know, those who uh, have any uh, visual uh, difficulties. So we, we experimented, we actually experimented a lot with the videos in the beginning. And there were ways like the, um, our, uh, our, um, a video uh, video person his name's Hassan he was he was he was doing a lot of the filming and him and Ahmed were doing a lot of the editing and they were trying to really you know make the make a lot of the elements in the video pop and be really nice and engaging and colorful and visual and but then uh, as much as these ideas were really nice and we Chelsea and I we liked them but then we had to also stop and say you know what no we're actually going to have to make the first of all the accessible decision here. And second of all, the more sleek, the more timeless decision, which is, you know, white background, you know, a Chelsea uh, on the right or the left, or even in the center of the video. And then any of the musical notations that appeared had to be completely black on white background and had to be, uh, and any of the text that also appeared had to follow certain uh, rules and guidelines for, um, for accessibility and the fonts that we used as well. So even the design of the video it, itself had to be you know, done that way as well. And and I think that that's a, a good consideration. So it, it, I know that it's a video and I notice it, it, at the end of the day, something people watch, but even making it really considerate with the choices and the fonts and the, and the, the layout you, that you use, I think is, is also, uh, it goes a long way. Thanks Nadine. All right, well, we are closing in on an hour together. So now is the time if you have any um, last questions that you would like to ask our guests or comments. I see there's still some sharing of tool tools in the chat, which is great, um, and some different techniques and strategies for um, transcription and captioning. So thank you for all of those ideas and sharing. I'm pausing for anyone to turn on their microphone and squeeze in a, in a question. And okay, uh, I think I think we're um, I think it's time to say farewell uh, and to thank all of our guests. Naomi, Chelsea, Nadine, and Josie, and to thank all of you for your questions and your work and for being here today. And um, I'll hand things over to Zoe for any closing comments from our friends at Rebus. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'll add my thanks uh, to our guests for sharing their experiences. I think there's some kind of clear trends out of that that a lot of people will be facing as they start working with these. And thank you to everybody in the chat as well who's sharing all these resources. There's clearly a huge, very practical list that we will pull out and we'll share that uh, along with the recording and the transcript of this um, this session. Also, if anybody's curious, we have a person who we deal with for our captioning. Um, we're in a position to do so as an organization. So she's kind of a, an extended part of our team almost, um, who, who we found online. Um, that obviously is not always the, the way to go. But if anybody's curious how we manage that. Uh, so uh, yes, again, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I, I hope that you will have, continue to have a wonderful uh, week and are staying safe and healthy and close with friends and family, even as we socially distance. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Uh, our session is on making modular OER. 
So again, kind of very practical thinking about how we approach creating content um, for, for modularity, which has lots of purposes and positive effects. So you can come next time to find out what they are. Um, and you can uh, find both the OTN and Rebus online, of course, and follow everything we do. We're at Rebus Community on Twitter, and uh, you can find Karen and her team at open underscore textbooks. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Wonderful to, to see and hear from you all. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. It was nice to see you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank it's good to see you. Um...